Taker, please call the roll. Alderman Lazara. Here. Alderman Jacob. Here. Alderman Winger. Here. Alderman Catalano. Here. Alderman Sismarski. Alderman Roy Wesley. Here. Alderman Woods. Here. Alderman Eugene Here. Wesley. We have a quorum. Uh, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting October 10th, 2013. Do so I have move. a second? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Report and recommendation, Potter Street Beautification. Mr. Forrest. You're welcome. And on the agenda, uh, number four, it says report and recommendation for the Potter Street beautification. As you're probably aware, there was not a memo in your packet. What I'm going to give basically is just kind of a verbal update on the status of that. Uh, if you'd like something, a memo in writing, I can have something together for your council packet next week. But as you uh, may recall, staff had a meeting with all the property owners along the East Potter Street area that's uh, still zoned industrial concerning conditions there, concerning encroachments into the Metro right of way. Uh, I did talk to our contact at Metro. He has had their real estate division, or I'm sorry, their legal division send a letter to all the property owners along that stretch of Potter that may have personal property or storage encroaching into the right of way to remove it. Unfortunately, his first letter did not have a compliance date so I talked to him again today, and he said he was just advised today by their legal department they are sending a second letter to those property owners with a compliance date. So the first step is going to be for those property owners to remove their things from the metro right away. At that point, he has already submitted a request in to their real estate division, <clears throat> excuse me, to have crews go out there, cut the tall weeds and grass, clean out the drainage ditch. So that is all in the works kind of moving along. Uh, he's probably going to put me in touch with the engineering department so we can discuss uh, the extent of what they're going to be doing in that south drainage ditch along their right of way uh, because we do have something we'll be talking about later. One of our detention ponds does empty into that ditch so it's important that it operate properly. Uh, okay, before you, I think uh, Alderman Lazara had a question. Yes, yeah, Alderman Lazara. Jen, you mentioned a compliance date. Do you have an idea of what that date is? I don't. I, I expect to be copied the letter. I was not copied their first letter, although I, I am getting a copy of that from one of the property owners. Uh, but I did request that he send me a copy of the second letter that goes out so we can be a little more in the loop okay. on that. Uh, I mean, we came to the realization that, yes, some of those businesses are encroaching past their rear property line onto Metro's right away, but the bottom line is it's not our responsibility to get them to get that off of somebody else's property. It's Metro's responsibility to require them to do that. All right. I mean, I would sure like to see trees planted along Potter before, you know, my, uh, <laughs> my term is over. So, you know, thank you. Okay. And that leads me to the, the second part of my comments. Uh, after we had the meeting with the property owners, uh, mid-summer, we sent out a survey form to all those property owners uh, to see, kind of gauge the interest in participating along with the city in uh, a program to, you know, to improve the appearances of that gateway into the city. The surveys have been slowly trickling in. In fact, we still got one in last week. So far, all of the property owners have agreed that they want to participate with the city to do something along those rear property lines to uh, improve the appearances, whether it be planting trees or some kind of landscaping. Uh, one of my questions w it was asking if they would be willing to grant a five or a ten foot easement for access for landscaping. And again, they've all said that they would be willing to do that. So at this point, all the property owners are, uh, are on board with that. Uh, I've had a lot of contact with one uh, a property owner over there that owns three or four of the properties, and I talked to him again today. He says, just let me know when we want to get going, and, and I'm ready to go. As far as the front of those properties, uh, we staff's kind of talked about it. Um, and I think I talked with you about it the other night, Alderman Lazara, about the only thing we could really do there is all of those properties between Central and Ash have paved out to the street, to the paved street line. Well, part of that is city right-of-way. 
So even though for years that's been paved, it's been utilized by some of those companies, about the only thing that we could really do along there if we really want to do something on the front of those buildings would be reclaim our right-of-way, take that paving out, maybe put some kind of landscaping along the front of those properties if we wanted to go that route. Something to think about and maybe talk about at a future committee meeting. So that might be one option we can do over there. John, can I hold you one second? Sure. Alderman Eugene Wesley. I, I just have a question on that letter that went from Metro. What if they don't remove that stuff? Do we get involved in going in there and, and legal opinion, do we get involved in help Metro cite him, or, or how does that work? I mean, it's on Metro's right away. I mean, we aren't sending the letter on the city. Mr. Forrest. Well, again, unless uh, Mr. Bond wants to comment on that, it is Metro's property. Uh -huh. I'm sure Metro has quite the legal team, and I'm certain that if they do put a deadline down there, there will be a consequence to these property owners if they don't comply. But as far as the city getting involved with that, I'll let Mr. Bond comment on that. Mr. Bond. Thank you. Yeah, Metro does, as uh, Mr. Forrest indicated, Metro does have, a, a, it's their property. They have the right to uh, make sure that their uh, property is being maintained properly and that anything that's put on their property is subject to being uh, policed by them. Uh, the city doesn't have any legal authority to be able to enforce the, uh, the, the, the code against uh, another um, someone else on their on that property but there is a legal mechanism for them to do that they can go to court and uh, and seek to uh, uh, complain against that uh, individual or seek to enjoin them from uh, from depositing or whatever but the uh, the city doesn't have any independent statutory authority to be able to uh, to make that enforcement okay, can I do a follow -up? Alderman Wesley uh, and, and the other question I have is I understand the tree issue that we're going to ask for the right of way to plant trees is that the city's going to pay for that whole project, or is, is a business is going to help pay for some of that project? Or is Metro going to help pay for part of it? Mr. Forrest. In a perfect world, the master plan here, uh, we have so, some things, uh, uh, we have a, a project in the works up in the industrial park that may result in uh, this particular developer contributing several dozen trees to the city. In addition, we have uh, a subdivision that will be coming forward at the next council meeting that we're going to be closing out where we're also going to be getting several trees. Uh, when, when they give us these trees, we have the option of planting those trees where we want to. So again, in, in the perfect world scenario, which we're hoping there's a very good possibility that the majority of the trees that we're going to be planting are going to be provided to the city for their use by others. And who's liable to maintain those trees after they're in, in play? Well, again, that's something I've talked to the property owners and the, all the property owners have agreed, at least verbally, that they would take care of watering these trees uh, until they become established. Once they become established, we'll have to see we'll, what kind of an agreement we actually... Anything about maintaining the landscaping, I would assume the city attorney would include in the uh, uh, easement agreement that we're going to have to have with these property owners because we will have to have an easement agreement with each one of those because that'll be of record on the property. Right, because if you really look at it, if the city pays for it, and, and I'm, I'm in favor of doing something like that, we in, improve their property regardless of the city's mm -hmm. dollars. Sure. I'm just saying there's got to be some. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And one f oh, Before we move forward, I'd like to see that in writing, how we're going to handle that. Sure. Alderman Jacob. Um, like Frank, uh, I too would like to see something done over there. Um, another idea I had for the front of them, which might even be a little easier, a lot of towns now with landscaping, they're actually putting like planters out. I think Bensonville even has that. Um, that might even be an idea for some small trees and planters possibly. Um, you know, just something to keep in mind instead of taking the asphalt away from the, you know, the companies there. Mr. Forrest. That's I mean, kind of my final comment on this is what we're doing right now is I have the city clerk's office researching to see if we have any active license agreements with any of those property owners. Uh, if Typically, if somebody wants to use part of a city right away that's not developed for parking or for their business use, uh, they would have to have a license agreement with the city, approved by the city council, typically signed by the city manager. 
So uh, I've got the clerk's office checking all those property addresses to see if we have any active license agreements with them now. If we don't, that'll make it much easier, and I totally agree with you. Doing some raised planters, for example, you probably would not have to take the asphalt out. You might have to uh, take part of it out so you have some kind of drainage uh, so that doesn't create an issue, you know, uh, collecting water or something. But no, I think putting some sort of vegetation along the front of those buildings would help quite a bit. I would have to assume we would need to put money in the CIP for that. But that's a distinct possibility. Alderman Roy Wesley. Um, I don't know how close the right-of-ways are to this. I'm sure it's right next to the street. And if you do landscape in there, you got to worry about salt, salt tolerant wood planters. Well, I believe Potter Street right-of-way is 66 feet wide. Probably only about 25 feet of that is paved. So we could have easily another 16 to 20 feet on either side of the actual paved street that's part of the right-of-way. So yeah, we could, we, obviously we'd have to locate them accordingly. You wouldn't want them too close to the street because then they become a traffic hazard as well. Okay. So that's the update on that, unless there's any more questions. No more questions. And you're going to follow up with something in writing? Is that what you were saying? Sure. Okay. Uh, next uh, report and recommendation, Potter Street Detention Pond. Mr. Forrest. Okay. Uh, as as uh, we mentioned in the memo several years ago, uh, we had some real flooding issues along Potter Street at uh, Hemlock and Ash and, and to a lesser extent at Central Avenue. It was decided at that time that probably the best solution to that would be to put in a storm sewer and then we used part of the Pine Street right-of-way between Potter and uh, the Metro right-of-way as a location for that pond. That was designed in-house, I believe. Uh, we've so far been unable to find the plans. I believe that pond was built in the early 2000s, so we haven't been able to find plans for it. Um, it did solve the flooding issue that we were having at all those intersections during the rain events. Unfortunately, now it's also created another issue that it uh, has silted up over the years. It's not operating as designed. Um, in talking to uh, the city's consulting engineer, uh, in their opinion, natural wetlands grasses were part of the original design at the time. That was right at the beginning of when the trend was kind of starting. Uh, the new trend in best management practices is to use wetland plants in detention areas as opposed to having them be totally dry bottom. Uh, Dry bottom ponds, unless they're carefully maintained, can have a uh, tendency to hold water at some point, so you want the type of vegetation in there that's going to utilize as much of that water as, as possible. Uh, there's quite a bit of silting that's occurred inside of this pond. Uh, in fact, last fall, I believe, or actually early this spring, uh, public works staff went in there and cleared out. There is a concrete ribbon that runs from the Potter Street side of the pond to the north end of the pond, which uh, kind of abuts the Metro right-of-way. And there was a concrete drainage ribbon in there that was supposed to carry the water through to keep that pond dry, and it was buried under about 8 to 10 inches of silt. So we've had the city uh, engineer out there attached to your memo. They came up with three possible solutions to that problem. Uh, staff recommendation would be to go with the dry bottom pond, uh, which would be the $64,000 option. What we would want would be uh, direction to have the engineer go forward, do a little more investigation in there, and then come in with an actual plan that we could, we could utilize. They came up with three uh, actual different ideas. One of, two of those were dry bottom ponds. One of them was just a matter of clearing out some of the silt that's in there and actually adding some soil to the pond to be sure that everything slopes to that concrete ribbon that's existing and through the use of elevations and grading and so forth, let gravity carry the water uh, you know, from the pond 
to the north end where it then discharges into the Metro right-of-way, which is again, we go back a step, that's why it's so important that Metro come in and get rid of the weeds and the grass and clean those ditches out so this pond operates properly. The second option that they had that would be, a, again, a dry bottom pond, but it's also the most costly, would involve putting in drains underneath the surface of the pond, having those directed to a collector sump pit on the outside of the pond, and then pumping that into the ditch from there. Uh, that's going to be the most costly option. Uh, we may have some property line issues with the Metro right away. We'd have to work with Metro to allow us to do that. It would be a complicated system that would involve some maintenance and so forth, but it could also be effective. And their third option was uh, to do a lot of regrading in there to actually lower the elevation of the pond five feet in the center and create a wet bottom pond. And then use native plantings, wetland plantings, and so forth, and just keep it as uh, you know a wet bottom pond. So we've got uh, a couple of issues over there that we have to, to look at is there's a roof drain that empties into that detention pond from an adjacent property to the west that was built after the pond was done. Uh, I've already spoken to that owner. For him to disconnect and redirect that roof drain is not going to be a big issue. He doesn't really have a problem with it. On the other side of the pond, there are, uh, there's a group of four townhomes, and their sump lines also empty into that pond. That's going to be a little more complicated to solve that issue. Uh, you know, we've reviewed the approved engineering and the approved building plans. It did show the sump lines were supposed to go out the west side of the building. Unfortunately, it didn't totally specify where they were supposed to end up. So uh, those plans were approved by uh, the city engineer that was on staff at the time, and the final inspections were also approved by the city engineer that was on staff at that time. So. I've already talked to the city engineer. We've kind of talked about a couple of different options to deal with those sump lines and how we can handle those, either redirecting them out of the pond or including them into one of these designs, but having it so that they positively drain out of the pond and they do not create, uh, you know, and so they don't wash away uh, the bottom of the pond like they're doing now when they, when they empty. So. Um, I think what, what, we're, what staff's looking for would be some direction, again, to include in the CIP one of these options uh, to go forward with the design and implementation of that. Alderman Jacob. Question on the dry bottom pond. Um, exactly what do we mean by dry bottom pond? Well, there would be positive uh, drainage so that the pond, after a large event, it would be, I mean, it is a controlled release so that it empties slowly, but by, gra by using elevations and just gravity, the pond would empty itself and dry itself out after a rain event when it would have been holding water. Alderman Jacob. So we're not, I mean, that would solve the problem of all that mess in there? Correct. Right. Okay, thank you. Alderman Lazar. John, we have to do something with this pond, is that correct? I mean, we can't leave it the way it is. In my opinion, yes, we need to do something with it. Okay, so our best option would be the first one then, right? The, the one that would cost the city 64000 that would solve our problem? On paper, it will, yes. Was this part of the flood study, um, this detention pond, when we were talking about some of the areas that we could improve? In other words, would this be like part of the checklist? I don't believe it was in the study. I think we're really talking more about aesthetics and, and kind of getting this pond to operate how it did when it was originally designed and installed. I mean, right now it is not operating per design. Thank you. Alderman Roy Wesley. Um, John, I want to go back on that 
statement that you made you couldn't find the plans do you scan the plans at all and put them in the computer or do we not have that option to do that we've been scanning some of the older files uh, for several years actually and putting those on disks for some reason the plans for this pond which as I recall, the pond was designed by our, an engineer we had on staff at the time. And as I say, so far we've not been able to find a copy of those plans. Alderman Roy Wesson. Okay. The sump pumps go into this pond. And you're saying dry, po dry pond. Correct. As we know, sump pumps are always going off. How are you going to get dry on that? Well, as I say, the city engineer and I have talked about a couple of different options. One of them would be to redirect those sump lines so they don't empty directly into the pond. Another one would be to revise the piping of those sump pumps so that they don't come out, you know, three feet above grade and then splash down into the pond. Uh, you could repipe those so that they actually discharged at the bottom of the pond and either put some rock riprap in there or somehow extend that so that the water, when they did discharge, would go to the center of the pond and then go down the concrete ribbon and out of the pond. Okay. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Hi, let's back up here. The price tag is, if we approve this, would be 64000 That's just the pond now. That's not county engineer to reroute those sump pump lines, is it? Well, first let me say these are ballpark figures. We don't have any actual plans. Right. Uh, you know, we, we asked the city engineer to come up with some conceptual things, what we could do to fix this pond. So first of all, yeah, let me make that clear. Okay. Um, Does that I, count rerouting those sump pump lines? I so don't you know believe you can't it. can't go after the builder for that because we approved it. Right. I, don't I would have there. to double check. They do have, again, on, on these cost breakdowns, they did break down all the different steps and what the cost was. And on, this, on the, uh, the one dry bottom, it says extend footer drains. So I would want a definition from the city engineer. But of what I it don't means think it that. said reroute those drains. It does, no, there's nothing in here so, that says specifically so reroute those. So that's going to cost us money to reroute those drains. My other question, was that a con, the engineer that designed it, was that our engineer we had on staff here or was it a, a engineer company that we don't use anymore as I recall it was this engineer we had on staff okay so my question is before we move forward with this I would like to see ballpark figure what it may cost or reroute those sump pump lines too because that that's not figured in there guys I mean we agreed that the the other guy agreed to disconnect his own by itself, or are we going to have to disconnect that other one too? Just the gutter. The gutter. Is he going to do that, or are we going to have to do that one? He seemed agreeable to take care of that himself. Okay. So my question is, the price before I would even vote yes for this, I would like to see what ballpark figure it may cost to reroute that piping for the, the, those sump pumps, because we don't have that here. Mr. Mermis. Yeah, as Mr. Forrest has stated, I think what we're looking for tonight is not exact figures or moving forward. Council had been asking about this pond for a while, so we want to um, confirm that it's a priority to plug into the budget for next year, we'll get the numbers and the CIP, then we'll approve it like a normal project. But if Council doesn't want to move forward with the pond, then we can just stop worrying about it tonight because we've been talking about it for a while. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Here's my problem. And my problem is, here we go, here's half of this puzzle, and here's the other half that's going to come down the pipe for us. Why could we not have a whole puzzle in front of us and make a rash decision that we want to consider putting in CIP? That's a problem. I, I just don't want it piecemeal. You tell me coming back with prices, well, give me the whole picture, guys. Mr. Mermis. Well, look at it this way to make you feel more comfortable. It's either a problem or it's not a problem. 
If you think it's a problem, then you want to move forward. If you don't think it's a problem, then we can stop talking about it. Uh, Mayor. Jeff, bottom line, we're after those people, those businesses on Potter to clean up their stuff. Our pond, I mean, we're asking them to clean up and we're not going to clean up. It's not right. But like you said, CIP, we've got those discussions coming up. Not only is this project going to be discussed at CIP, you've got to discuss. We had residents in here from both sides of Wooddale Road uh, a couple weeks ago for Quiet Zone. We're going to discuss power lines, Elgin O'Hare. We've all sat through that meeting. So CIP and budget, we're going to have to make some decisions. I mean, basically, do we want to do we want to go forward with this? Staff will have to plug in some numbers, and then council is going to have to make some decisions on what needs to be done first. That's about I me. Mean, we're only going to have so much money to go around. Not to mention at Wooddale and Irving Park with the safety improvements, we don't have any money put aside for that water main that we're going to do. We're going to get some some grant money, so we're going to have to come up. So, plugging it into the CIP, unless people have an objection, I don't see if that, that's a big deal. We should do it, and then the decisions will have to be made. Alderman uh, Jacob first. And I'm not sure if we have to make a motion, but I'd like to make a motion to put it into the CIP. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, report and recommendation for closure property maintenance policy and procedures. Uh, let's see. Mr. Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, staff recommendation is to pretty much continue policy and procedures currently enforced by staff uh, with the addition of establishing a fund in the budget for emergency cleanup and securing of properties when determined that uh, it's necessary by staff. Uh, it's no secret to everybody that the status of the economy the last several years has caused quite a few foreclosures and we've had quite a time in the last several years dealing with abandoned properties, people vacating, just leaving properties. Sometimes the sheriffs come and move all their debris out, leave it in the front yard. And it's been uh, sometimes difficult to track down the responsible party to take care of these. So in the past, we have uh, moved forward on some properties using uh, city services staff when they're available or when they have the time and or using uh, consultants to come in and, and cut the grass, cut the weeds down, get rid of the garbage and so forth. What's happened, and I think the city attorney can probably comment on this further, uh, a couple of years ago, the state, actually I don't even think it was that long ago, one of the problems we had is if we had to go in and clean up a piece of property, our remedy would then place a, be to place a lien on that property to enable us to recover our costs. Well, until very recently, those city liens were all the way down at the bottom of the list. Everybody would get paid off before they would come to the city lien uh, for taking care of that property, and chances are we, would we never got reimbursed for those. There was some legislative action which has now allowed the municipalities, if they have to take care of a property and put a lien on it, those now become priority liens and they're right up at the top with paying off the mortgage and paying the real estate taxes. So that, that in itself, has helped us. Uh, also, what's, what's happened is uh, the banks have finally kind of gotten it through their mind that there are going to be consequences for them leaving these foreclosed vacant properties unattended. And uh, they're hiring more and more. They're hiring these maintenance firms to come in when they have a foreclosed house. They clean up the property. They secure it. And then on a regular rotation, they have landscapers come in, cut the grass, cut the weeds. So our issues, property maintenance issues and so forth with foreclosed vacant structures has, has it's almost become, I can't say a non-issue, but it's become something that we don't have to spend a lot of time on anymore. When we do find foreclosed and vacant properties, we do still post them if the property appears that it's uh, in disrepair. What that does is that allows staff to come in, do some life safety inspections prior to allowing reoccupancy. I did put something in the last sentence in here about establishing a fund. I did have a further conversation with our code enforcement officer. I mentioned the sum of $10,000 in here. 
what that would be for is, again, if the city needs to move forward and remove garbage and debris and furniture that's left in a front yard and cut down weeds or something, rather than have to search through an account to take it out, if we would have a line item established that we could just draw off of, hire the consultant to take care of that, and then pay them out of that. I did put a figure of 10000 after talking with our code enforcement officer earlier today. He seemed to feel that uh, that amount was excessive, that we really wouldn't need it. So I think even if we went with $5,000 in a fund just specifically earmarked to clean up uh, vacant foreclosed properties if needed would be more than adequate. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Where do we take the money from now when we pay for uh, cleanup? What account is that coming out of? I would have to get that information from Mr. Wilson. <coughs> so we don't know where the money is coming from now and how much we paid so far on cleanup on properties? I don't know. I would, I would have to get those figures from Mr. Wilson. It's not excessive. So are we looking to consider this for next year's budget for 10000 Yes. No, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not looking to establish the fund now. I'm looking forward. I'm sorry. I should have specified if we can set up an account for next year's budget. I, I guess my opinion, put in a budget and see what happens. Alderman Jacob. Uh, what is our policy on maintaining these properties? Well, they're expected to be kept in compliance with the property maintenance code, just like any other property in town. And what is that? Is that the 12 inches in 10 days or? Correct. As far as grass and weeds, that would be the same. As far as the condition of the structure, uh, they're required to have, uh, they, I mean, there can't be broken windows. There can't be doors that are kicked in or unlocked. The building has to be secured. If it's not secured, uh, we would, I mean, in the past, we have had these structures boarded up. And in fact, we even added a section to the building code several years ago that if we have to go to the point of boarding up a vacant building because it's not being taken care of by the owner of record, you actually have to paint the plywood so that it matches the exterior of the home so that it's not, you know, totally unsightly. Well, let me, Jacob. I, I guess my next question is if we want to consider changing that policy, would that have to be made through our the other policy for property maintenance or through this? I would, I would think we could include that in more of a big picture conversation about uh, making changes to the property maintenance code. I mean, we do have uh, a mo that model ordinance that was prepared by the city attorney making the time limit from notification from 10 days to three days to cut the grass. I know it was, uh, we had discussed it, we never brought it forward because there was still, I think, some concern that that may not allow somebody enough time. But uh, if you want to make some changes to that, yeah, that would be, you know, a separate uh, report and recommendation concerning property maintenance issues. At this point, uh, the agenda item for tonight was just the foreclosed properties. Okay, thank you. So. Okay. What? You don't need any action from us. That was just in form formative, correct? Correct. And again, just to uh, you know, kind of put you on notice, then that if it's agreeable to you all, we will put a small, uh, you know, we'll put a line item in the budget for maintenance of. Uh, right. Well, it would make sense properties. if we're expending capital to to improve those properties that we had a line item specifically we could look <coughs> at and go, okay, last year we spent three thousand which would be able to answer uh, right. Alderman Wesley's question. Alderman Correct. Eugene Wesley. That's exactly it. I'd like to know how much we spent so far and what account it came out of, because I have no clue what account it came out of. Well, if someone has it tonight. Uh, Mr. Wilson's out of town, so I don't think we're going to get that answer tonight. I think if he, yeah, he would have answered it. Um, Okay, so that ends that. Uh, items to be considered at future meetings. Do we have any? Alderman Roy Wesley. I guess it would come under planning. I want to talk about um, redoing the wards for the election because Ward 1 is a lot larger than Ward maybe 2 or 3. 
remapping? Does that come under planning? Uh, well, let me ask a question, Mr. Bond. Is are there some time constraints or other issues that we? Yeah, there's a couple of a uh, couple of things you need to do, and we explored this at one time a couple of years ago. And the uh, you have the right as a council, if you wish to uh, redistrict, uh, you're not obligated. There are certain statutory requirements for you to obligate and uh, that obligate you to redistrict, and that is if there's a significant disparity between the size of the wards. And in the analysis that was done based on the information we'd gotten from the election authority there at that time, there wasn't sufficient to mandate that. Now, there was a disparity in the amount or the size of those awards, but it didn't require under the municipal code that it didn't mandate that you make those changes. You as a council can do that. What you generally do is you would gather the data, find out how many uh, you know, uh, registered voters are in a particular ward, and do that for all of them, and then do a comparison. And there's other things you need to do. You need to have a mapping. You have to work with your uh, the, the county mapping department and try and figure out what the impact would be if you re redrew the ward lines, whether there's any impact on local precincts. So there's a, it's about a four-layer step uh, that you have to involve other units of government. Uh, in uh, there are some time constraints. Obviously, you have to do it in advance of a uh, of a municipal election um, in order to do that. Uh, but you know, it it can be done if the it's a desire and will of the council to do it. And there's a couple of steps, and we'd already gone through those initially, so they're in place. We would just simply have to update the data if that were the case. If the council's direction was uh, to go forward. So, so uh, well, could we put it on? It sure. goes under planning, though, right? Uh, probably finance and administration, I would think, maybe. Oh. I would think the opposite, I think. I would say finance because we have to pay the attorney for doing it. Well, it's, it's really an administration, because you have finance and administration, it's, it's really a, a part of the administration uh, a function, but okay. I mean, there's no, it's because it's a unique item, there's no magic place for it, but. I'll turn it over to finance and administration. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any. Any other? Alderman Jacob? I have a question for Mr. Mermis. Um, do we have property maintenance on the agenda still, or, or is that coming up? Or, or? Mr. Mermis. The, la <coughs> the last time we talked about the foreclosure property maintenance, we kind of morphed into property maintenance, so there's no other outstanding issues on the agenda other than what we discussed tonight. Okay. Well, I'd like to put property maintenance onto the agenda. Okay. Any? Alderman Winger. What are we going to discuss on property maintenance last time we discussed it? I believe that that um, 10 days to three days failed. So w what are we looking at doing in this next go round? Alderman Jacob. Um, actually, I thought we were in favor, but then somebody tabled it. I thought it failed. Well, I, I, was, I was going to say, he, he wants it on the agenda, I understand. You know, but we can't debate it this evening, so we'll 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 put it on the agenda and we'll debate the issue again. And in, and we're looking at discussing the days, or are you looking at discussing the length of grass as well? Like well, what, just the whole. What, where are we going with it? The whole policy. I mean, if you read our, if you go online and look at our policy, we're supposedly sending certified letters to people, and that's not happening. So we have to look at our policies. Okay. Okay, thank you. It'll be on the agenda. No other items. I make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned. I would like to call the Public Works Committee uh, to order. Uh, roll call. Um, actually, the minute taker, just make note that uh, the same people are here. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting on October 10th, 2013. Do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes. Report and recommendation, pay request partial number 16 to Maxim Construction Corp for the North WWTP upgrades phase 1A project and the not to exceed amount of $443,752.24. That is my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed. I think that passes. 
And report and recommendation, uh, change order number one, North WWTP upgrade phase 1B. Uh, I'd like to turn that over to staff. Jeremy? Yes, thank you, Alderman Lazar. We have a change order one here uh, with phase B or phase 1B of the North Wastewater Treatment Plant upgrades. And uh, essentially, uh, William, the Williams Brothers Construction Company, the contractor, they are asking for a 90 day extension on the end of uh, the contract so that they would have 590 days to complete the project instead of 500. And basically that is because uh, the, the IEPA loan was delayed, the, the approval of that loan was delayed several months, um, as well as uh, Maxim uh, causing delays as well on site. Uh, so uh, we're asking for a, a 90 day um, addition to the 500 days they've already been granted to complete the project. Okay, Jeremy, um, are they asking for a later date as far as starting time? Uh, they are uh, on schedule to start uh, November 11th. And was that the, the time frame that we first thought, or is that a delay? Uh, the, that's uh, a little behind what we initially thought. Uh, it's, it's been kind of a, an issue of getting Maxim uh, out of their way before uh, Williams Brothers can really start and have full access to the site. Okay. Um, so I think one of the main concerns that uh, the council would have, and we would like to see if we can get this answer tonight, does this affect our loan in any way? Uh, no, it does not. Um, so what do you need from us tonight? Do you need a recommendation? Yes, to approve change order number one. Okay, so we need a vote on that. Okay, I'd like to make that motion. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. We have a report and recommendation, professional services agreement, amendment number three, HR Green Inc. Construction phase services for the North WWTP upgrades phase 1B project. Again, Jamie, I'd like to turn that over to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, again on this one, uh, staff recommends uh, approving amendment number three with HR Green uh, for an additional 90 days of construction uh, supervision services. Uh, so this is, is pretty much tied to change order one. And uh, if Maxim, or excuse me, if Williams Brothers Construction Company was to use those extra 90 days, then we'd also have to have our engineers supervising the site and managing the project for an extra 90 days as well. Uh, so what this does is basically add those 90 days uh, to HR Green's contract if needed based on the extension of the Williams Brothers contract. So. All right, any questions? Alderman uh, Eugene Wesley. I have one question. So say Williams Brothers, we have a mild winter and, and they finish this project early. Does that mean I'm getting a rebate from both contractors? Am I getting a rebate for HR Green if we don't need them for the three extra months? Jim? Uh, well, with uh, Williams Brothers, there wouldn't uh, be any reason for a rebate because there's no ex I'm sorry, I'm addition to the HR contract, Green. additional amount. Yeah. Am I getting a rebate? With HR Green, uh, with this amendment we're speaking of right now, it uh, it's, it's only to increase the contract amount if it's needed. So if they only take 500 days as originally planned, then HR Green would not bill us any additional days. So. Okay, but there is still another contract for, coming from HR Green for you rebuilding it that we haven't approved yet either. Am I correct? Well, I think that's what we're doing tonight. No, it, it isn't. This is a total separate contract to extend for Williams Brother on, on the 90 day contract extension, but we still have another bill from HR Green that we don't have a contract in front of us for the design when we did the UV building that we don't have that in front of us either. So this is just for the extension of 90 days. So right, there's, still the another, there's still another contract coming for HR Green for the design. Of it. Uh, I was hoping we could have done them all at once. Oh yeah, I, I, I think that's a completely different contract, right? Right. Yeah. I thought we were going to do them all at once. Oh, no. Okay, just those two right now, just the extensions. 
Yes, that's correct. On both H.R. Green and Williams Brother. Okay, I'd like to uh, make that in the form of a, uh, a motion. Do I have a second? Second. By amount not to exceed. Well, we don't have an amount because... Fee can be covered by the 6000 What? Where are you reading that? That's from... Construction services fees can be covered by the loan of six thousand. What what is the contract amount for extending it? Uh, this amendment number three would extend the or would add eighty one thousand dollars to the contract, which is you know nine hundred dollars a day times ninety additional days if if we're if they're needed. Alderman Woods. Why why are we extending HR Greens? Because we just oh, Jamie, you want to answer? Uh, basically, because we're extending Williams Brothers' contract 90 days, so. But HR are we, Green, we are we extending? Aren't we just moving theirs over? Aren't they starting later and extending? And isn't HR Green there already because of Maxim? So I'm just wondering. I mean, it almost sounds like we're we're paying twice. That's my underlying question. I just want to make sure that's not happening. Um, only only 500 days were covered in the, the agreement as, ex, at a, as it existed before this amendment number three. For Maxim's 1A contract? No, this is for HR Green's management of the site. Right. For Williams Brothers. But they've been managing, so. For the second phase, yes. So Williams Brothers is actually asking for more time even though they haven't really started the job yet, but I thought that request was only because they're not officially starting. They moved in trailers, but they're really not starting the work because they can't start the work. Correct? Am I? Yes, well, that's correct. Okay, right. so maybe he's chomping at the bit. I don't want to take <laughs> over. I don't want to take over the meeting, but. You don't. <laughs> the, um, we're, we're adding 90 days, and, and uh, probably the underlying reason for that is the delay caused us to start. We're now starting in the fall, close to winter. Mm -hmm. So the contractor is getting two winters and one summer in this 500-day stretch instead of two summers and one winter. Okay, so he is asking officially for more work time. This is not just a matter of moving over a slot because there's no room on the site to officially start and gear up. So it's correct due to that movement is causing him to uh, project a job to take longer because now we're going to seasonally we're going into two winters. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that there, not that it would ever happen on HR Green's part, but it almost sounded like there was. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I made that motion. Did, did I have a second? Was it 81,000, right? Not to exceed 81,000. Is that okay with the second? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That passes. Not at the committee level. You do at the council level. That will require a yes. I have items to be considered at future meetings. I do have one uh, that I'd like to put on the agenda. Um, the Stormwater Committee would like to host a cleanup uh, Salt Creek Day, and they would like to um, see if we can have the city um, kind of help us organize that. We do know that Elk Grove uh, does that, so maybe we can have someone from staff reach out to Elk Grove and see how they're organizing that. Uh, does anyone else have anything for uh, Alderman uh, Wesley? Um. Yeah, I want to see if we could put in our contracts for any projects being done that they notify the residents of what is being done. I had a resident that the gas company came in his backyard, started marking up his backyard, and the project was across the street. And no, notific no notification of what's going on. Where was that at? On Addison Road. Where we're gonna put, where we're putting that sidewalk in. Okay. But 
we need to put in our contracts or something that the engineers, whosoever project that is, that they notify the residents of where Julie might be marking. Yeah, we could put that in the agenda. So I don't know if that, I would think that would go into contracts. Jeff? Yeah, typically uh, that type of thing does happen. This one slipped between the cracks. Um, we'll make sure to tighten up uh, language, I guess. I don't think we need to bring it to committee. Okay, so we really don't need that on the agenda. Okay. We'll just make sure he does it. Anything, anything else? Uh, Mr. Woods? Could, could we look into, I've gotten many calls on those ponds at Elizabeth and Wooddale Road. Uh, it's a long story. We've gone back and forth with them and we either have to enforce something on the owners there or, or I, I'm not quite sure what we need to do but you know uh, this summer there was mosquito issues uh, with the one elderly couple uh, because of the sitting water and the, the grass and lack of maintenance on those I'm, I'm not quite sure where to put that or how to address that but it doesn't go away Go ahead, uh, Mulder and Wesley. Um, Jeff, do you have, you said it was going to be in our packets, or are you going to give me the list of the ash trees that are coming down? Is that list done? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, we worked on the list this week. Um, I was planning on getting that in, into the report, like I said, tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. I thought it was going to be in. My drop box here, since I'm getting used to this thing. You're, you're a day too early. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, anything else? Like a motion to adjourn? A second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Motion to adjourn. I'll call the Finance Committee in order to make the minute take it. The same people are present. Uh, report of recognition. Le uh, election office code conduct manual. You have to approve the minutes. Oh, the minutes. Approve the minutes for October 10th. I'll make the motion. Second. Corrections, changes, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm getting ready to okay. oppose. <laughs> no one opposed. And then we'll go item number four, which I already said we were going to talk about. Who's taking that one? Mr. Pat Bond. Uh, thank you. Uh, you've got uh, proposed rules. This is, uh, would be uh, incorporated into uh, the rules of conduct into the existing city code of section 2.207. Essentially what it is, it's sort of seven simple rules, if you will. Um, these are all statutory obligations that are set forth in the uh, Illinois Municipal Code. They're also set forth in the, uh, currently in the uh, city code. They're just not all in one place. And the purpose of the proposed rules was to have, uh, it was twofold. One was to have all of the uh, conduct uh, rules in one central location, A, and B, to have it so that it was, you didn't need a law degree in order to ascertain what you could do and what you were allowed to do and what you were prohibited from doing. So I uh, attempted to, to do that. And, and again, you've got seven different uh, general rules. And within the, uh, the, the role or mem uh, council member's role, you've got a, a summary of six things that are uh, permitted or prohibited that are very specific to your discharge of your duties as, a, uh, as an alderman. All of you have taken a, uh, an oath of office to uh, discharge your duties in accordance with that oath. Uh, in, accord in accordance with law. So um, I know there's been a lot of debate and discussion about this, and uh, there's nothing in here that is not currently imposed upon you as a obligation or a prohibition. Uh, but as I said, what we've done is we've taken them all to put them collectively into one uh, location and to put them in a way that it would be very simple for those who are sitting up here now and those who follow you in the future to know what is expected of them, whether it's a new alderman or one who, of long tenure, to know exactly what is, uh, what is uh, permitted, what is prohibited, and uh, kind of guide you, give you guidance uh, as you uh, discharge your statutory responsibilities. Mr. Woods. 
I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, after after all that, I mean, I don't see that what we have to pass or adopt. I think it's great that you put it together. It's in a booklet that can hand it out to all the aldermen and use it as orientation for all the new aldermen. But since it all exists, I don't see the need to uh, recreate the wheel, so to speak, and, and, and pass this. I do appreciate it all being in one place, condensed for the ease of everybody's reading, for those people who don't like to go through those volumes of boring text. Uh, thank you. Mr. Jacob. I, I guess a question for Pat. So there's nothing in here that's not already in the other books. Mr. Bond. That's correct. Now, some of it comes from state statute under the Illinois Municipal Code. Uh, some of it comes from your existing city code. And what this does is takes all of those and puts it all in your city code and all in one, uh, one spot. But these are already statutory obligations that are imposed upon you as you sit here today. Mr. Jacob, you have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if Mr. Mermis or the attorney would answer this, but if that's the case, why can't we just instruct the city manager to hand this out to all elected officials? Why, why are we voting on it? I, I'm, not, I'm confused why we're going to even vote. Who's the Mr. Pat Bond? Well, uh, I'll give you an example. One of the things, you've got a section of your city code that, uh, that identifies the uh, role of the city manager, and it provides the city manager has exclusive authority to hire, fire, discipline employees, direct staff, prioritize city projects. So you have to extrapolate from that authority that you as a council don't have that authority. Um, so, and so what I've done is I've specifically put under section G, one through six, and it specifically says that the council should not direct city staff how to perform their jobs. The council, met, you know, so what it's done is it's put it in, uh, you know, what you would have to extrapolate from what's currently in your code is put in very plain language in this section as to the sort of the do's and don'ts. So you don't have to go to, as Alderman Woods uh, indicated, you don't have to go to the Illinois Municipal Code, take one section out of the Illinois Municipal Code, and then look to the city code and, and put those two and read those two in conjunction with one another, and then say, how does that apply to, to mine? So what it does, it's for ease of interpretation, and it's, uh, it's really designed to be a very succinct, simplified uh, method uh, of, of codifying the conduct of the council. Mr. Jacob. Okay. Um, now, now you're confusing me a little bit more. Now, is there something different here, or is there not something different here? Yes or no, Mr. Pat Bond. There is nothing different than what you're, in terms of the legal authority, than what you're currently obligated. But as I said, you've got to read several different provisions of state law and several different provisions of the municipal code of the city of Wooddale in order to come to these conclusions. And it, now you don't have to confer with a lawyer to interpret these various sections. You've got it set forth uh, in front of you. And again, when I say you, I'm talking about collectively you and those who, in the future who will be looking to this. And it really is designed to provide guidance to uh, the alderman, so you don't need a law degree in order to say, what is it that I, as an alderman, can do? What am I supposed to do, and what are my responsibilities? You have it right there. Somebody can go to, to the code in the future in section 2.207 and say, oh, okay, I understand that. And I don't have to look and say, okay, because you've got currently, you've got a section of the city code that tells what the uh, aldermen do. You have a section of the city code that says what the mayor does. You have a section of the city code that says what the manager does. You have sections in the municipal code that set forth the different uh, authorities that are out there. And what this does is puts it in a very concise, uh, and believe me, for a lawyer to put a page and a quarter together uh, with all of that information, that in and of itself was a challenge. You know, more, more, you're talking, more hands are going up. Mr. Art Woods. <laughs> Once again, I, I applaud and appreciate the effort, and I think it will help some people that don't want to do that reading, but I don't see it as something we have to pass. I, I think it'll be a great handout to the elected officials uh, and, and excellent uh, new material for the orientation of, of new aldermen or, or mayors, as, as they may be, or treasurers and, and city clerks. Um, but I. But I don't see the need to pass something that already exists. I, I get that you clarified some of those things, but 
Uh, I guess for me personally, I'm not ready to accept all those clarifications as fact. Thanks. Mr. Frank, sir. Pat, exactly what are we passing? What, um, what is it that we're seeking? Go ahead. Okay, you're, what you're doing is you're passing a codification uh, in your city code of provisions of the Illinois Municipal Code and uh, clarifications of the uh, current city code. So what you're doing is you're codifying that. In other words, you're, you're making that uh, law in the city code. It becomes part and parcel of the city code. Some of these are currently in the code in other fashions. Like I said, the, the city manager's role is already set forth, but the, the, the sections that are set forth in uh, G1 through 6, those are not, there, there's uh, statutes that provide that you as an alderman, if you have a, a conflict of interest, that you're not uh, uh, supposed to vote on any matter that you, you have a conflict, that you're not to vote on any matter that you will be the final arbitrator, make the final determination. So what this does is it codifies those statutory uh, restrictions in the city code. Uh, and so what is being sought to be adopted are rules of conduct which will be incorporated into the current city code and will be read in conjunction with those other sections that appear in various uh, provisions of the code and it will incorporate uh, state statute language which is not currently in your code but is, uh, you are obligated to fi follow by uh, statute. Mayor, please. Frank, did you, sorry, did you have a follow-up, Frank? Uh, no, I would let the mayor react and then I'll... Mayor, please. Okay, Jeff, Pat, I think I've heard both of you say a couple of times that some of these codes we have in our so-called books are obsolete and no longer in use and we're going to redo some of these codes. Basically, I know I heard about this about six months ago and I wasn't too excited back then, but is this going to replace something? Is this going to be the first of replacement of the codes in some section? Because I heard we're going to go through a lot of those codes. Some of those are no longer useful. When is that taking place, or is this the start of that day? Mr. Pat Bond, are you answering it? Or is sure, that? I'll answer part of it, and then Mr. Mermis can place the timing of it, because as you know, pursuant to the city code, the city manager is the one who sets the, uh, prioritizes the project and generally administers those, so I wouldn't want to overstep my boundaries so in you that, are that regard. Uh, but with respect to the answer to the mayor's question, the answer is yes, this is the, the first uh, in a series, and this would be a, revisions to this, a revision to the city code. There are some items that are in there that, you know, state statute has changed, some case law interpretation have changed, not with respect to these items, but with respect to other parts of the city code. The, the unfortunate reality of, update of, the, of the situation is updating the city code is a Herculean task to do it and to uh, make those clarifications. And, you know, it's not as pressing as your wastewater treatment plant and some of the other things that you have going on. Um, but we are not, right now, you're operating in compliance with uh, the changes in state law, but we do have some uh, obsolete sections of our code that need to be updated to make sure that they mirror uh, the current, uh, current state of the, the law. You know, the Open Meetings Act, uh, Freedom of Information Act, those have all been amended. In recent uh, in recent years and continue to be amended so we need to address some of those and it's uh, this is the first uh, of those and it happened to rise to the top just because of the uh, discussions that the council had with respect to um, situations that had occurred so Mr. Frank I'd like to uh, make a motion to adopt this to our city code Do I have a second second I have a question or two before I'll call the roll on this. Um, my question is, Mr. Pat Bond, let me ask you a question on this situation here. City manager has the right to hire and fire all su supervisor and hire and fire all department heads. My question is, does it give the city manager a right to create new positions in, in his title without the council approval? The, uh, well, the, it, the city manager is the one who's going to create the um, organizational chart 
and determine which uh, positions are necessary, but it's up to the council ultimately to fund those positions. So he can say, I need six assistant city managers, and if the council does not fund six assistant city managers, he doesn't get six assistant city managers. It's a cooperative effort, it's a team effort, but the city manager is the one who's going to make a recommendation to the, to the council. If, you're, if he increases the head count, uh, that requires uh, specific council approval. If he has any budgetary impact on the, on the creation of a position, that requires council approval. If he's redesignating uh, titles or positions, that's within the uh, the scope of authority under the city manager's uh, responsibility. I'm going to do another follow-up question, Mr. Bond. What? That's fine. He can restructure his department heads whatever way he wants without council approval. But when it comes to money increase on those positions, he needs council approval. You cannot tell me that just because it's in the budget, in the salary budget, that he can do it without the city council approval. Am I correct? You are not correct. So he could go ahead and give a supervisor $8,000 raise or $10,000 raise without this council approval? That's correct. Within this confines of the budget, if he exceeds the the, uh, al the amount that has been allocated or budgeted by the uh, City Council, he has to return to the City Council for approval. What isn't, it, my question to that follow-up is he's, even though those positions are not filled, that money is in the, in, in the salary account, but if he wants to create a, a person to a higher position, and give him a raise somehow, he's got the authority to do that? Yes, he Then does. what we should have did as a council, which we possibly could have done, is hold all that money back when we lost those employees and not spend that money at all and move that money out of that salary account. Could we have done that? Mr. Well, Mayor in order Brown? to do that, you would have had to do it by way of a budget amendment, and you would have had to remove those, uh, those monies that were budgeted for those positions from whatever line item they were in the budget line item or in that particular department line item. I don't know how it was well, structured. We, we could still do a budget amendment like next week if we really wanted to then and move that money out of there. Am I correct? Well, if, they, if the personnel changes have already been made, that becomes a very difficult situation the positions to positions have not been filled yet, I'm assuming. I, you know, I don't know that I have enough facts relative okay. to that. But generally, the city manager has the authority to hire, fire, to establish the, uh, the, the designation of the positions. If he's going to change, uh, in the organizational chart, you approve on an annual basis, and that's generally done in connection with your budget approval, because if you're going to add a position, uh, you know, you as a council are going to, to change the funding. If mid-budget mid year, there's a shift in positions, there's vacancies, and the uh, city manager is shifting personnel or reclassifying or redesignating someone, that's completely and absolutely within the scope of the authority of the city manager, yes. Well, they also have authority to go ahead and hire a new position <laughs> in the contract if it's not in the contract, which I don't own the contract. I, Create a p new position that's not listed in the contract. Is he the authority to do that too on a contract? To create a, a contractual position or to create a union? A union position. Well, there's a pr process if you're creating a union position. You have to give notification to the uh, union, depending on the, uh, the, which collective bargaining agreement you're referring to, and I don't know which okay. one it is, but they have a specific provision. If you're going to uh, increase or eliminate a position, the union is entitled to notice. That's a contract-specific question. I'd have to know exactly what position and which contract you're referencing. Yeah. Are we done with that? I'm done with that. Mr. Jacob. I guess I just have a question for Pat. Is this in here somewhere? I'm not sure where we're, why we're talking about salaries. Is that something in here? Or? I'm asking for the city manager's role. It ain't in there. I want to see if that was going to be put in there. Isn't, doesn't the city manager already have a contract? I mean, that gives him his responsibilities? Well, he's got his res I'm sorry. Go ahead. City manager's responsibilities are set forth uh, his, in his contract, but more uh, fully set forth in the, city, the current city code. Okay, let's do a roll call on that. The motion on the floor is second. Roll call. 
Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? No. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Abstain. Alderman Woods? No. Alderman Eugene Wesley? No. That motion fails, right? That the motion fail, right? That's correct. Okay. okay, any other items? Okay. Have anything else on the agenda? All right, the uh, items consider future meeting FY13 audit on November 14th. TIF. November 14th, property consolidation insurance bid result the 14th. Anything else? Mr. Woods. Mr. Mermis, uh, do you have a, an idea or concept of what that uh, primer is going to be on the TIF? Are we having outside people come in? Yes. Our... Yeah, <clears throat> there's a, a firm that Mr. Wilson has been working with that's going to come in and kind of give a brief overview um, to the council um, free of charge it's been quite some time since the council has received a uh, educational process on this um, in fact there's probably only two of you that have received the presentation is this the company that we would be using or are using they're just they're offering coming. their services probably hoping we will use them down the road. And, and the name of this firm is? Or I believe it's we? Ellers and Associates. Ellers. Okay. Thank you. All right, anything else? I'll obtain motion to adjourn. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks. Aye. One more thing. <laughs>